Good evening. We call to order this JDO meeting of May 12, uh, 2021. The first item on the agenda is the call to, roll, the call to order. <laughs> if the clerk could please read. Voting members, Mayor De La Isla. Here. Deputy Mayor Padilla. Here. Council Member Nager. Here. Council Member Lesser. Here. Commissioner Ripon. Here. Commissioner Cook. Here. And Commissioner Mays. Here. We have six present. Wonderful. We have quorum. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the action items. Action item A of the quorum. Mayor, may mm -hmm. I go ahead and call the roll oh, call for yes, uh, absolutely. non voting members? Non voting members, Council Member Hiller. Here. Council Member Valdivia Akala. Council Member Ortiz. Councilmember Emer Emerson. Here. Councilmember Dobler. Here. Councilmember Duncan. Councilmember. We have four present. Thank you. At this point, we do call the action items. Action item A, if the clerk would read. Item A is approval of the February 10th, 2021 JETO board meeting minute. We have received the minutes as part of our agenda packet. Does anybody have any comments, corrections, or additions, or deletions to the agenda? Motion to approve. We have a motion for approval. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second by Councilwoman Nager. Uh, comments or questions with regards to the consent agenda, uh, the, the consent agenda, the minutes of the meeting? Seeing no questions with regards to the meeting, we proceed by voting. By roll call. Mayor De La Isla? Yes. Deputy Mayor Padilla? Yes. Councilmember Nager? Yes. Councilmember Lesser? Yes. Commissioner Ripon? Yes. Commissioner Cook? Yes. And Commissioner Mays? He's saying yes with his thumb. Yes, I, I know. We wouldn't unmute for a second there, so. We have seven yes. Seven yes, the motion carries. At this point in time, we move on to item B, if the clerk would read. Item B is approval of an incentive agreement between Go Topeka and Project Central. Go Topeka, the floor is yours. Mayor, at the December 1, 2020 JNO meeting, the approval of Project Central's funding occurred with a total approved incentive of $284,000 based upon their capital investment of $9.5 million and the addition of 50 new jobs over the next five years, each of those with an average wage of $40,000 annually plus benefits. This investment will result in an economic impact of $150 million over 10 years and a 316% return on investment. In Section 6, if they don't maintain a minimum of five, the agreement will terminate. All of the incentives approved are performance based to be paid out as earned. With the approval of the contract agreement in your packet this evening, we're pleased to announce Project Central is J6 Enterprises, which is the parent company of Fairview Mills. I'd like to virtually introduce Jason Hammes, Special Project Manager, to address and share comments related to the project and their growth in our community in this video.
Barbara, can you hear us? I can hear you, but I cannot hear the video. Okay, that's that's exactly where we're at. So it's not you controlling it? No, Red okay. is controlling it. I hoped that you could hear it. <laughs> we could not. My apologies. No worries. Perhaps he's very soft-spoken. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm having trouble getting the audio going through. Um, hey, it's okay. We're, we're Zoom compassionate here. Give me just a second. All right. Molly, is there anything that we could pause this item in the agenda and maybe go to the other incentive where we may not have a video while they solve that issue? If the body would be okay for us to just make an adjustment in the agenda and move up the next item. Uh, Barbara, are you there? I'm saying. Okay, so would you like uh, if the clerk could read item C of the agenda? Thank you. Item 3C is approval of an incentive agreement between Go Topeka and Project Gateway. Take it away, Barbara. Thank you. Also at the December 1, 2020 JDO meeting, the approval of Project Gateway's funding occurred with a total approved incentive of $840,000 based upon the addition of 168 new jobs over the next five years with average wages of 43,000 annually plus benefits. This investment will result in a $520 million economic impact over 10 years and provides a 712% return on investment. In section one, I'd note for your reference, the FTE positions they employed when the funding was approved were 54. And in section six, they fail to maintain a minimum of 45. The agreement will terminate. These incentives are performance-based as well. Be paid out as earned and details are outlined in the contract agreement in your packet. With the approval of the agreement this evening, we're very pleased to announce that Project Gateway is Mercury Broadband Services. I'm also very pleased to announce that Matthew Sams, Chief of Staff, to, is here with us this evening and can address you directly and share comments related to the project and their growth and success in our community. If Matthew can be allowed to speak, he's with us on the Zoom. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this evening's meeting. Uh, my name is Matthew Sands. I'm the Chief of Staff at Mercury Broadband. Um, Mercury Broadband is an internet service provider working to close the broadband gap in rural America. As a community-first organization, we work to recruit and develop talent from within our communities that we serve. Late last year, we began renovations on a building at 3400 Southwest Van Buren. Uh, these renovations are expected to be completed in quarter three of this year. The new office space uh, will serve as the call center for our subscriber network, which will be growing to serve six states throughout the Midwest in the next six years. Our new call center will bring an estimated 168 new jobs to Shawnee County. Uh, Project Gateway will allow us to continue our mission of recruiting and developing from within our communities by providing hiring and training incentives to help us grow our workforce. On behalf of the Mercury Broadband Leadership Team, we want to thank uh, Jetto and Go Topeka for the partnership opportunity to bring more jobs to Shawnee County. See no questions. What is the pleasure of the body? 
I'll move to approve. We have a motion Mayor for Mayor. approval by Commissioner Mays. We have a second by Deputy Mayor Padilla. Additional comments or questions with regards to this approval? Seeing none, we proceed by voting through roll call. Mayor De La Isla? Yes. Deputy Mayor Padilla? Yes. Councilmember Nager? Yes. Councilmember Lesser? Yes. Commissioner Ripon? Yes. Commissioner Cook? Yes. Commissioner Mays? Yes. We have seven yes. Seven and voted yes. The motion passes. Congratulations. Typically, what we would do at this point, we would celebrate and we would have a little photo op with you. Um, we hope that in the future months, when we have our next celebration, we could be able to celebrate all the organizations that are choosing to stake their ground here in our community. Um, and we'll celebrate with you and have a fun photo op. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we feel ready to go back to the video in item B? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so if the body is okay, we've already read the item. Um, this would be uh, resuming the conversation on item B. Uh, Barbara had explained already what the incentive was, and she was in the process of introducing us to the business. Um, hopefully it works. My name is Jason Thomas, and I'm a special projects manager for Fairview Mills in Seneca, Kansas. Wanted to take a quick opportunity to thank this group for all the support that they've given us thus far uh, in the expansion of our business uh, in the Topeka area. Um, Want to extend a special thanks to Barbara over at Go Topeka for all of her help to this point, the county commissioners that we've met with, and ultimately the support of the JDO board uh, in pushing Project Central forward. Um, this project will allow us to expand our opportunities as a company into a human grade pet food operation in Topeka, Kansas. We're excited about the expansion this brings to us. And we're also very excited about the capabilities that Topeka, Kansas brings already to our team and in the future. We're very much proud to be a part of the Topeka, Topeka community and would like to continue to see that presence grow. Thanks again for all that you've done to, for us to this point, And we look forward to more time together, particularly in person. Take care. Seeing no questions or hands raised, what is the pleasure of the governing body? Move to approve. Councilwoman Nager moves to approve. Do we have a second? Deputy Mayor seconds. Additional comments or questions with regards to this incentive package. Seeing none, we proceed by voting by roll call. Mayor De La Isla? Yes. Deputy Mayor Padilla? Yes. Councilmember Nager? Yes. Councilmember Lester? Yes. Commissioner Ripon? Yes. Commissioner Cook? Yes. Commissioner Mays? Yes. We have seven yes. Seven voted yes. The motion carries. Thank you very much for our new partners in our community, and we, we wish them much success and much growth so that they can continue benefiting our community and for their success as well. Um, we now move on to item D, if the clerk would read. Item D is approval of Go Topeka 2019 and 2020 audit. Do we have Natalie or our auditor? Yeah, uh, I'm Morgan Penn with BT and Co. I'm just going to step in and, and get started. And I apologize in advance. They've just started mowing the grass outside my window, so there may be an occasional pass of a loud mower. I don't think it's not too bad, but timing um, wasn't perfect. But here we go. Uh, again, my name is Morgan Penn with BT and Co. We've got for you tonight the uh, 2020 and 2019 audit report for Go Topeka um, in final version. It's going to take you through some of the highlights of that. There's actually two documents here. 
One is the actual financial statements and one is our report to the board of directors. I'm gonna start with the report to the board of directors and just point out a couple of things. The items in this communication are pretty standard required communications that we make in all audits. Um, and they're kind of a report to the board of Go Topeka on how the audit went. A couple of things to, to note and in that is if you're following along on page one of that document, um, adoption of or change in accounting policies. Note that there were no new policies put in place and no changes to policies made, accounting policies made during the year um, in Go Topeka's accounting uh, functions. We also, uh, at the top of the next page, talk about audit adjustments. We did have one audit adjustment that we found as a result of our audit procedures, and that's attached at the back of that document. The rest of the items in this uh, packet here is the management representation letter, and that's on um, Go Topeka letterhead, and it's written, it's signed by Natalie and, and Molly and Josh Patterson, and that's that letter affirms in writing to us all the things that we were told during the course of the audit by management. And once they sign that, that is their final acceptance of the audited financial statements. Um, that's several pages long, three or four or five pages long, but it is all pretty standard. Um, normal items that we see in most of those representation letters. And then the very last page in that is the audit entry that was made um, to adjust some of the accounting that was done initially on the land given to Walmart um, that was initially recorded at, uh, in a different way that we have proposed that be fixed. So that's that item. If we get into the actual consolidated financial statements themselves, um, these are consolidated, like I said, and those include both Go Topeka and the East Topeka Learning Center Support Corporation. Go Topeka is the sole member of the, learn the support corporation, so those are consolidated. Um, and any transactions that occur between those two organizations have been eliminated, so they're not grossed up um, in terms of how they're presented in these statements here. Uh, we have our independent auditors report. That is, a, we are giving a clean, unmodified opinion on the statements, which says that the statements are materially correct in accordance with the accounting standards. So that's good, um, the best opinion you can get, and that's what we have for you for these financial statements. The next page there is page three. It's the Consolidated Statement of Financial Position. It's going to show total assets at, 20, at the end of 2020 of $24.2 million. Um, the... Uh, you can look down through there, compare those balances from 2020 to 2019. A lot of them are, are unchanged. Quick note that restricted funds of $1.4 million, that is the Mars escrow account um, that has still had a balance at the end of the year. The biggest change in any of the asset balances is the land held for economic development. And that is because of the large amount of land that was given to Walmart in 2020 as part of an incentive package. So the value of that land that Go Topeka is still carrying is obviously reduced as a result of that. Total liabilities at the end of the year is $22.7 million. Um, again, not a lot of changes between 19 and 20 there. Uh, you'll see those improvement and training incentives for $1.4 million. Again, those are amounts earned by Mars that they have to draw, and those are all funded in the escrow account. So that's um, there. And then the long-term debt that is shown there, that is the debt in the um, East Topeka Learning Center support corporation and we'll look at a footnote on that here as well and then all the net assets of 1.5 million dollars are um, unrestricted so there are no donor restrictions on any of those page four statement of activities uh 2020 information is on page four 2019 is on the next page but we'll just look at 2020 for now total support and revenues of a little more than five million dollars the majority of that of course is in jado grant revenue that revenue is recorded as it is spent by go topeka so um that's the amount they have spent um, on uh economic development activities during 2020. Then you have expenses, total program expenses are about $9.7 million. Majority of that's in economic development of 8.7. Uh, a big number of that for 2020 is the, um, the land that was given to Walmart and the incentive. And we can look at that on the next page as well. But that's majority of what's in those economic development um, or a good chunk of what's in that number. Then supporting expenses, which is general and administrative, is $735,000. So for the year, Go Topeka had a net loss of $5.4 million. Um, a majority of that is, well, because of the land given to Walmart, um, there was expense for that. The data revenue was actually recognized when the land was purchased and the developments were paid for. So that's when the JADO revenue was recognized. Um, then that was back in 2010 or several years ago. Um, but now that that land has been given in an incentive package just recorded as an expense resulting in a, in a net loss for the year. 
Okay, uh, flip ahead to page six, statement of functional expenses, just gives you some more detail on the expenses, um, both by program and type. Not a lot to mention there, but um, it gives you some further breakdown of those. Statement of cash flows is on page eight. The other statement's on an accrual basis, so it doesn't necessarily follow how cash changes hands, but this statement will show you how cash changed during the year. Uh, there was negative $133,000 from operating activities. That means day-to-day -day operations used that amount of cash. We then had a small influx of cash from investing activities. So net result was a, a very small $12,000 decrease in cash for the year. Okay, footnotes start on page nine. Um, the one footnote, uh, note number two, is the summary of accounting policies. I mentioned before, but this, there were no new policies or no changes to policies. I just wanted to mention that, and we're going to go on from that. But the rest of those, that page, those couple pages there, just to describe what the various accounting policies used by uh, GoTopeka is. The next note I want to look at is note number four, which is on page 13. This is availability and liquidity. This is going to show you, um, of all the assets that are on the balance sheet, what are the liquid ones? They can be liquidated and used to cover or fund operations in the next year. So $13.2 million um, on a consolidated basis is what in that um, of the assets are liquid and can be converted to cash to cover operations for the next 12 months. Okay, note eight, flipping up a couple pages ahead on page 15, this is the restricted cash and restricted funds note. I mentioned this before, but you do have a couple of restricted assets that are on the balance sheet. Uh, the $1.4 million is again, the Mars escrow account. Um, and that shows you how that account changed during 2020. And then the last paragraph there describes that $3.5 million restricted funds, which is the amount that the, the um, Learning Center Corporation is holding in escrow as required. Note 10 on long-term debt, I'm going to give you the terms and information on the debt that is held in the East Topeka Learning Center. So that's over the bottom of page 15. Uh, the top of page 16 is going to show you when mature, when principal payments are due. Um, nothing's due the next, in the next five years. You're making interest-only payments at this point, um, but that will be paid in 2027 in terms of the principal amount and then reduced by the loan fees that are being amortized over the course of the um, mortgage. Note 11 are related party transactions. We do have some um, related party transactions just like we've had the last couple of years. Under due to and due from, it does mention that GoTopeka does owe $178,000 to GTP at the end of the year. And that is all for items that GTP has paid on behalf of Go. It's a combination of salaries, um, other reimbursable costs and other shared costs that again, GTP paid on Go's behalf and Go will need to reimburse them for that. The top of page 17, there's a couple other small amounts that are due between Go Topeka and other GTP related entities. Those are just described there. Under revenue, Go Topeka received $193,000 from GTP for affiliate support and for reimbursement of expenses that were paid with private dollars. And then under expense, Go Topeka does give some grants and some other contributions to GTP related organizations, and that's described there, as well as the amount of rent that Go Topeka paid for their proportionate share of the space that's leased by GTP. A couple last footnotes. Number 13 on page 18 concentrations of major customers. Obviously, JADA was a significant funding. Um, source for Go Topeka, and that's noted there. So 86% of the revenue came from JO during 2020. And if that was discontinued, the organization would have to be obviously curtailed, activities would have to be curtailed accordingly. Note number 15 on incentives, there was $1.4 million paid in cash incentives during the year. And then there's a list there of some outstanding incentive commitments that exist for Go Topeka. These have not been earned yet. They're performance-based, and so they're not earned until those companies perform. But if everybody performs like they're supposed to according to those contracts, this is what is expected to be paid out under those incentive agreements over the next five years. One last footnote, 16 on page 19, this is risks and uncertainties, talks about COVID-19 and the impact that it um, possibly could have in the future. Um, it's not known for sure, but it is reasonable to expect that after 2020, there would be an impact in the organization as a result of that. Can't be quantified um, at this point, but it is uh, possible that there would be some impact.
in the last several pages there is just consolidating information. So it'll show you this, the information for Go Topeka, this um, East Topeka Learning Center, and then the eliminations that we had to get to the consolidated numbers, both for 2020 and 2019. So are there any questions I can answer? Any questions for our auditing team? Or for the Go Topeka staff? See, none, I will say that I, I am very grateful for the one-on-one -on -one, uh, attention that the Go Topeka team gave each and every one, you know, that was interested in having a one-on-one -on -one deep dive on the audit. Um, I felt very prepared. The other thing that I think is noteworthy is Natalie has done a phenomenal job ensuring that the organization's finances are, you know, up to par. We had a, a comment last time with regards to um, controls in the organization, and those mm -hmm. things have been rectified. So for, for those who are watching and, and are audit nerds like I am, this is a really good thing, um, especially as this organization merged several other organizations into their coffers and have managed the way that they have. So Natalie, great work. Um, if there's no questions for the team, um, what is the pleasure of the governing body? Motion to approve. Motion for approval by Commissioner Cook. Do we have a second? I'll second. Commissioner Ripon seconds. At this point in time, do we have additional comments or questions with regards to the audit? Seeing none, we proceed by voting through roll call. Mayor De La Isla? Yes. Deputy Mayor Padilla? <laughs> yes. Councilmember Nager? Yes. Councilmember Lesser? Yes. Commissioner Ripon? Yes. Commissioner Cook? Yes. Commissioner Mace? Yes. We have seven yes. Seven having voted yes, the motion carries. We now move on to item E, if the clerk would read. Item E is approval of revised 2020 through 2021 carry forward agreement between Go Topeka and Jetto in the amount of 14.2 million. Molly or, okay. Good afternoon, wow. Um, okay, so as customary, we presented a cash carry forward agreement in December at our December meeting along with our 2021 budget. At that time, we estimated our cash carry forward numbers and normally we're able to come in very close to those numbers by the end of the year that we present in that cash carry forward number. This year during our audit, an adjustment was identified that impacted that cash carry forward number. Morgan touched on it briefly um, on the adjustment in the audit report. As a result, that cash carry forward numbers deviated enough from the initially approved number in December that we wanted to bring an updated cash carry forward agreement before this body. So as Morgan touched on the adjustment, um, a little bit, the adjustment was centered around the Walmart incentive agreement that was granted in 2020. So a, a portion of that incentive agreement was a gift of land to Walmart. Because that gift of land was a non-cash transaction, that portion should not have impacted the cash carry forward number that was presented in December. The impact on that cash carry forward number was actually accounted for years ago when that land was initially purchased. So as we um, adjusted for the financial statements for this impact, it adjusted our cash carry forward number. And so this adjustment is resulting in a higher number of 14.2 million as compared to the number that was brought before the body in December of 11.1. .1. And so we are asking for um, you to review this change and approve this new cash carry forward number. That's a very brief and quick description. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has around that adjustment, if there are any. Is there anybody interested in making a motion so that we approve this carryover or are there questions or discussion? I'll move to the Councilwoman Nager moves approval for the carry forward amendment. Second. Commissioner Cook seconds that motion. Do we have any comments or questions? 
Seeing no comments or questions, we proceed by voting. Mayor De La Isla? Yes. Deputy Mayor Padilla? Yes. Councilmember Nager? Yes. Councilmember Lesser? Yes. Commissioner Rippon? Yes. Commissioner Cook? Yes. Commissioner Mays? Yes. We have seven yes. Seven have been voted yes. The motion carries. At this point in time, we move on to item F, if the clerk would read. Item F is approval of MWBD carry forward request in the amount of $50,000. Glenda. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So housing affects us in so many ways. Educational outcomes, health outcomes, economic outcomes. Housing is critical to our community. And so as we continue to grow, we need to be able to say that we're growing our, um, our housing stock as well. We need to be able to say that as economic development happens or community development happens, it happens in the low to moderate income community. So as we reviewed the uh, interlocal agreement, we concluded that the project that we're talking about now fits perfectly. There's a statement in the interlocal that talks about urban economic development programs related to youth employment and the rehabilitation of blight, derelict, and underutilized facilities and infrastructure that they have been considered for inclusion. And so tonight, we want to uh, introduce this one project to you uh, for your approval. So before we do that, I want to tell you kind of how we, uh, we came to the step that we're at now. We were asked by our Go to uh, Topeka committee to set up a formal review committee to, to make sure that we were good stewards of this money and that we just didn't approve it without fact and presentation and learning more about the project. So step one was to have a, a review committee established. And so we're establishing, uh, we did establish this review committee with uh, some bankers, some business owners, and a couple of others to ensure that uh, we were following protocol as we were directed. President, uh, uh, well, the uh, Go Topeka Executive Committee was the first to receive the, the uh, presentation. And then we went on to the boards because you can't approve it unless you, I mean, you, you can't approve it unless you present it and it won't come to you all. So the first step was the review committee. Second step, the executive committee. Third step was the go, go board. And now we're before you to present um, this project for approval. I'd like to introduce to you uh, Ms. Nikki Ramirez Jennings to um, present on behalf of SENT. And SENT is Strengthening and Equipping Neighborhoods Together. So this is the Executive Director, Nikki Ramir Ramirez Jennings, presenting to you. And then I'll come back to you and I'll make the formal and official request for the funds. So Nikki. All right, thank you, Glenda. So I'm gonna work on this screen sharing here. Oops. There you go. Is the right one? Let me try this again. I am screen sharing. Can you guys see it? Yeah. Everyone, all my coworkers were telling me that two screens is the big thing now. So I've been practicing on two screens today. So this is my first two screen debut. Okay, um, good evening, everyone. Um, like Glenda said, I'm Nikki Ramirez Jennings and I serve as the executive director for Sent Topeka. SENT stands for our mission statement, vision statement, is intentionally walking <clears throat> with neighbors through loving relationships and strategic development to accomplish the holistic transformation of the neighborhoods in Shawnee County. SENT functions under three distinct pillars, education, cradle to career, business development and housing, that's rehab and new builds, and community wellness, where we walk with the people in the community so that we can teach them the importance of being proactive with health versus reactive with health. 
Um, in the high crest community, there's currently 2,060 homes, and we're excited to say now we can say there's 2,061 homes as SENT built one of the first new homes in the high crest community in over 60 years. We um, describe the high crest community as the California quarter, that's 29th to 37th Street, and California to Adams. Under one of our pillars, as we mentioned, is community wellness. Under this, you'll find the high crest market where one can find vendors, resources, and volunteers. Because it's important for that we keep our community dollars in the community, we also partner with the Topeka Growers Group and Leonard's Meat. And of course, not only is this for the High Crest residents, but we're walking with the High Crest residents when we put on these markets. We also employ a full-time mental health specialist who is currently partnering with Topeka Public Schools to help our teachers um, create and equip them so that they're creating um, trauma-safe um, classroom spaces. And we also provide COVID-safe telehealth spaces. Another one of our distinct pillars, as we mentioned, education cradle to career. Um, two years ago, didn't do it this summer, I mean, last summer due to COVID, but we had the launch STREAM program. STREAM stands for Science, Technology, Reading, Arts, and Math. Um, also during that program offered for the students and their families was bullseye classes that help with social emotional resiliency, which means we were walking with the families and the students enrolled in the program to teach them what it means to go from crisis to pre-crisis and to move in a way that everything that happened to them wasn't a crisis. Um, also, we recently launched um, Scent Prep Academy, our early childhood education center, where we serve birth through up to age five years. Um, our focus is not only birth age five years, uh, because we know that High Crest has been um, identified as a child care desert, but also providing resources for family and teacher retention. Um, our third business development pillar um, this year, we also launched an entrepreneur, excuse me, in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, we also have our housing, our curb appeal, rehab, and new construction. Our curb appeal um, is a great program where we get to walk with current homeowners in the high crest community to help them elevate their properties. And we do that with dignity and sweat equity because we love doing things um, when we walk with their neighbors, anything that allows them to have skin in the game. These are our current scent properties. There's a total of 15. Over on the bottom right, you'll see Fremont Hill where we recently acquired about 29 acres worth of land. Here at 3609 Southeast Humboldt was one of our first scent rehabs. As you can see, one of our signature things that we do on the rehabs is a very stylish mailbox, and most of our rehabs have orange front doors. Here is 3334 Southeast Gerard. We purchased this property for $1,000, demoed it, and this 3334 Southeast Gerard went to this 3334 Southeast Gerard. This is the home that allows us to say that there are now 2,061 homes in the High Crest community. We sold this home within 10 weeks. I'm sorry, two weeks, not 10 weeks. Sold this home within two weeks, and we sold it for $110,000. It's valued at $146,000. Here is the inside of 334 Southeast Gerard. Um, it is a three-bedroom, two-bath home with a crawl space. Here is 332 Southeast Gerard, and it was our um, second scent rehab. Here's 332 Southeast Gerard now. We priced this home at 75K so that um, anyone that was enrolled in the HCCI program, Housing um, Credit and Con Counseling Inc., sorry, they would be able to take advantage of this home. Um, we sold this home within three hours. This home sold at our ribbon cutting ceremony. Right here is the housing study, and we get really excited when we see this housing study because the key findings lined out in the study, um, confirmation for us that we are doing all of the six things that they mentioned in here, and if we're not doing them already on our own, we're walking with other community partners to accomplish these things. Here is Fremont Hill, the 20, uh, sorry, 29 acres of land that I mentioned. On the east side, uh, we want to have duplexes, single family, and premium single family homes. On the east side, it's our hope to have a condo. Uh, we currently have the High Crest Market the second um, Saturday of each month, so we want to have a permanent fixture for the market, a food co-op. We also want to have um, condos above the storefront that we would create so that those people that want to be homeowners but not want the land that comes with home ownership, there's opportunity for them as well. Um, with community development and housing, we know that there's always gaps. So on the left, you can see the things that we've identified of some of the gaps in doing this work. Also, there comes tensions. Um, so I want to speak to the tensions today, and we want to do the transformation, but we do have in place while we're doing this transformation to avoid things like gentrification. Uh, so for example, our homes are owner occupied, and we have written into our contract deed that if somebody chooses to sell, that we get first buyer's right at selling. 
Moving on down, uh, rent versus own. Why it's great to have a happy mix of rent and own. We know that having more homeowners is a benefit to our tax role um, in so, and that it helps education, it helps infrastructure, and it benefits those people that serve in positions like police officers and firemen. With pricing, with SIMP, one thing we do is we move to be helpful and not harmful. So the last thing we want to do is depress the housing market for the people in our community. So we always price our homes so that it's fair pricing. Um, to the left, you'll see some of our goals for 2021, but I'm gonna focus on um, the right-hand side, the opportunities to partner. Um, so if you're familiar with SENT and you believe in the work that we're doing, you know, one way that you can help us is always endorsing the work that SENT is doing in the community. There's opportunities to volunteer on all of our housing projects and there's something for everyone. Um, and you can also give financially toward our housing initiatives. And we're looking hopefully soon to acquire 20K towards rehab supplies and materials and another 30K towards new build supplies and materials. And back on the slideshow that had our 15 properties, there's an address of 3383 Irvingham. And we're really excited about that property because we're partnering with Washburn Rural High School. Um, their students as part of their career and technical um, portion of the school is building the first half of the home at 3383 Irvingham. And it's actually set to be moved on May 17th to its site if our Kansas weather cooperates. And then do you guys have any questions or comments? Nikki, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, incredible the work that you guys are doing at Highcrest. Um, governing body, what are your questions or remarks with regards to this item? And before I forget, thank you for sharing your time with Sam this evening. <laughs> Councilwoman Hiller. What's the $50,000 for? It would go towards 30 to a new build and 20 towards rehab. And the municipal that we're working on now is the 3383 Irvingham that we're partnering with Washburn Rural students. Thank you. Thank you. Other question. Okay. Nikki, yes. Uh, Nikki, has it, Nikki uh, I know, as, as we've seen, the, the price of construction materials has skyrocketed in the last few months. How is that going to affect your timelines or, or your budgeting uh, for some of these projects? Um, one thing this work has also um, taught us, Commissioner Mays, um, is how to pivot and get very creative with our resources. Um, so we do have plants in place, for example, um, you know, we recently learned that it can cost more to put up a six foot, you know, privacy fence with wood than to pour a concrete driveway. So in that way, we're going to pivot, you know, look at things like maybe we only need the wood in the back. Maybe we only need chain link, um, you know, black vinyl chain link is pretty sharp looking. So we are looking at ways that are more cost effective and using all of our resources so that we can maximize our funds. Thank you, other questions? Okay, if there's no other questions, this would mean that it would be an approval for $50,000 that would be allocated to cent. Uh, there's no questions, what's the pleasure of the governing body? Motion to approve, Mayor. Second. Deputy Mayor makes a motion for approval. Councilwoman Nager seconds that motion. Do we have additional comments or questions? Seeing none, we proceed by voting. Mayor De La Isla. Enthusiastic, yes. Deputy Mayor Padilla. Enthusiastically, yes. <laughs> Councilmember Nager. Exuberantly, yes. Councilmember Lesser. Absolutely. Commissioner Ripon? Yes. Commissioner Cook? Yes. Commissioner Mace? Yes. yes. We have seven yes. Yeah. Seven yes. I'm the disruptor, as always. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Sent. We're very proud of the work that you're doing in our community. Thank you for your stewardship to our community, to our citizens, and to the empowerment of neighborhoods that need support. Um, we now move on to the final item in the action items. Uh, item G, if the clerk would read. Item G is approval of innovation campus investment in the amount of five million eight hundred and seventy-one thousand. And and Molly, if, if I could take a point of privilege uh, as chair, I was in contact this afternoon with Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Padilla. He had a dual booking tonight. He wanted to stay as long as he could but he has assigned his proxy vote to Councilwoman Ortiz. Um, and, and that was notified to me earlier, but just wanted to make sure that you understood that he just left more than likely and that you will hear Councilwoman Ortiz become his proxy. 
Well, thank you. Good evening. I'm happy to join you to talk about this exciting stuff we've got going on here. I'll kick it off and then um, pass it over to Katrin. But we've been using this word innovation for a couple of years now. Uh, some people have been wondering what the heck that means. Now we have plug and play. We've got companies that are really looking at Topeka as their new place to call home. We're finishing up the first cohort of the Topeka uh, plug and play group here. And um, tonight we're here to discuss plans for a building to build on the assets that we have here in Topeka and Shawnee County that have been in place for a long time but largely untapped. We are talking about a physical space to retain and attract entrepreneurs and innovative companies focused around animal health and agricultural technology. Just like the visionary leaders 20 plus years ago strategically chose to buy land for future economic development, three years ago many of you joined the Go Topeka Board of Directors in a retreat where we talked about and dreamed about things like we're discussing tonight. We decided to be bold and take advantage of opportunities in front of us to continue to diversify our economy and surf while the tide is high. Pivoting to strategically focus on entrepreneurs and innovation in industries like animal health and ag tech is a large part of the future economic development plan for Topeka and Shawnee County. So I'll let Katrin walk you through where we've come from and what we're here to discuss tonight. Thank you. Can you hear me? Everybody good evening? Yes. yes. And thank you so much, Molly, for this introduction, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide an update today on the milestones that we have achieved and the upcoming next steps in elevating entrepreneurship and innovation in Topeka and Shawnee County. Uh, next slide, please. We have truly made remarkable progress over the last 18 to 24 months. Our strategic framework around people, places, and programming that had its roots in the Momentum 2022 strategy around building a better and more equitable economy, investing into quality of place, and attracting and retaining the right talent has proven to be the right strategy delivering results. Next slide. And next slide after that, please. As you all know, last year we celebrated the fact that Plug and Play chose Topeka to be the location for their first ever animal health accelerator program in the world. Plug and Play is the world's largest accelerator program with locations on three continents across 19 different industries. They have 45,000 startups in their ecosystem. They're one of the most active venture capital funds in the world with over 250 investments last year alone. Many of you have had the chance to meet and interact with Plug and Play as we kicked off our partnership in March of 2020 at Security Benefit with our first Innovation Day that drew over 150 attendees from across the region just before the pandemic hit. Some of you may have attended the virtual selection day back in October of 2020, where for the first time, our corporate partners, Hills Pet Nutrition, Effigy, and Cargill out of Wichita were introduced, and where we heard from 10 startups that were made aware of Topeka and our story for the very first time. Next slide, please. I'm pleased today to announce that the first full cohort of 10 startup companies, we call them Batch One, is fully underway. Those companies are developing products focused on pet health, focus, uh, food safety, livestock biome, and energy, and are currently located all around the US. There's one company from Singapore and one from Canada, and you see the logos on the screen. We have started to get to know them a little more over the last few weeks and certainly see an interest to learn more about what Topeka has to offer. As a reminder, we will welcome a minimum of 10 startup companies in Topeka twice a year as they participate in the three month accelerator program. And we expect that number to grow as we add corporate partners to the program. Speaking about our corporate partners, the feedback that we have received from them is consistently very positive. They are thrilled with the level of innovation these startups bring to their portfolio. They're highly engaged and benefit from the plug and play, play membership tremendously, maintaining competitiveness in the global marketplace, ensuring further growth. I'm also happy to report that plug and play has made 
two full-time hires on the ground in Topeka as of today, a program manager and a venture associate. The venture associate is going to move to Topeka uh, from St. Louis and that they're recruiting for a third position. This will further consolidate their presence here and help the program grow. I'd like to invite all of you to join us as we celebrate the graduation of that first cohort on June 10th. We're co-hosting this event with Plug and Play and BioKansas, the leading industry association representing biosciences in Kansas. For more information, please go to the Go to Pika website, and the link is in the slide in front of you. Next slide, please. So you may ask, how does all this benefit Topeka? Why would these startups move here? The reason why they're interested in developing a footprint in Topeka is the same reason that plug and play is here. We have many resources that are important for the success of a startup in animal health and agricultural technology right here and in the region. That is why we call it the Animal Health Corridor. Startups need to be close to their customers, suppliers, talent, and research partners. We have established strong relationships with our local and regional partners across the state of Kansas and are ready to make those warm introductions. On May 6, so just last week, 10 of those partners pitched their services to the plug and play startups including the KC Animal Health Corridor Organization, Network Kansas, the Washburn Small Business Development Center, service providers, and many more. We will continue these conversations to understand how we can best facilitate the growth and success of these startups, startups and I'm confident that our responsiveness to their specific needs will result in many of them considering Topeka for an office, research space, and, and more. Next slide, please. Which brings me back to our strategic framework around people, places, and programming. Plug and play is only one piece of the puzzle. Just like the Wheelhouse Incubator, which helps local startups and businesses grow, the Plug and Play Accelerator is a program that supports entrepreneurs and will attract new players to Topeka. But where will they go? In order to attract many of these new startups and innovative companies, we need to provide an attractive space where they can thrive, find the resources they need, work with mentors, develop ideas, share their thoughts with peers, and where they can attract the talent they need to grow their company. Next slide, please. And then next slide. Recognizing this need, we set up last year to find the right location and the right partner for the development of an innovation campus. We recruited two nationally renowned developers that specialize in research and innovation campuses and facilities and asked them to conduct independent viability assessments. Both assessments came back to us independently and said we highly recommend choosing a location in downtown Topeka to take advantage of the amenities that have been developed with previous investments, dining options, coffee shops, entertainment, proximity to local, state, and federal government agency, and yes, bike paths and trails along the riverfront. As a result, we zeroed in on three properties in downtown Topeka and embarked on a thorough due diligence process under the leadership of the Innovation Advisory Board. After almost nine months of consideration, this board made the recommendation to choose BioRealty as our partner and developer of phase one of the Topeka Innovation Campus. This decision was based on the partnership, location, timeline, and feasibility. While I cannot disclose the exact location due to ongoing negotiations, I'm happy to confirm that with your approval today, we may be able to open doors to this new innovation center as early as 2022. And yes, that's next year. This recommendation by the Innovation Advisory Board was ratified by the Go Topeka Board of Directors and has brought us here today. Next slide, please. I'm proud to I'm proud of the partnership we have built with BioReal. The developer really shares our vision of Topeka being a hub of innovation drawing in innovators from across the country and the world. 
with the negotiations with anchor tenants who have already signed letters of intent and we're finalizing a partnership with a large regional co-working space provider to up a large portion of the building. It will include wet lab and flex lab space, offices, meeting rooms, attractive rooftop event space and much more. It will have space to incubate local early startups that cross paths with later state startups raising their second, third, and fourth round of funding. It will house resources for our local small businesses. In short, it will be the place where Topeka's new economic development strategy of investing in entrepreneurs and innovation in animal health and ag tech takes root. And that is what Molly was just referring to in her introductory remarks. Uh, this new direction will be complementary to our traditional economic development strategy of focusing on Topeka's assets in logistics, advanced manufacturing, and financial services, and will make sure that we create higher wage jobs that are attractive to our high schoolers and college graduates to stick around. Yeah. Next slide, please. Freddie calculated the economic impact that we expect from this first building of the innovation campus. Over the next 10 years, we conservatively expect that at least $1.34 billion in economic impact will be generated. This calculation assumes that we only attract one startup out of 20 that will go, uh, that will go through the plug and play accelerator every year. Now that's really conservative. Next slide, please. One of the stakeholders I spoke with in the preparation of today's presentation asked me how I think this campus will change the landscape in Topeka. Here's what I said. We're creating a place with career opportunities that attract the workforce from all over the world and helps us retain our kids in Topeka. More startups and small businesses means more need for local services like accountants, marketers, lawyers, hotels, restaurants, nail salons. More innovation means our local corporate partners remain competitive on a global scale, scale and grow their number of jobs. It also means that Topeka will build a reputation of success as a place where innovators connect and where you go if you want your startup to take off. It will be the place that comes to mind when people think about and speak about the animal health industry. It will be the partner that facilitates new ways of collaboration across the region, across Kansas and the Midwest. With this investment, we will make Topeka sticky. Next slide, please. Whenever I want to get motivated for an important presentation just like today, I remind myself of the voices of many of the stakeholders that I have spoken with in the last few weeks and months, and I realize the vastness of this opportunity in front of us. Topeka needs to take bold steps. The time is now. The decision today will define where we will be in 30 to 40 years. Topeka is a leader, not a laggard. We cannot be afraid to invest in new ways. Next slide. With this in mind, we're asking today for your approval for a maximum amount of $3.041 million to launch the Innovation Campus and the maximum amount of $2.83 million over a period of nine years that will ensure that we develop the space and incentivize entrepreneurs and startups to grow their businesses in Topeka. I would like to emphasize that these are maximum amounts and we expect to come in below these amounts. Uh, the first amount, 3.041 million will come from carry forward dollars that we have available. The second amount will be allocated across nine years and will be part of the annual budget approvals going forward. The total estimated project cost for this first building of the campus is between 12 and $13 million. With this, I stand for questions. Katrin, I, I have to say, Matt always says jokingly and, and very fondly, by the way, that it's always awesome to have a German in your team because they get things done. And I, I just have to say that your execution of creating life 
from what was given to you from nothing has been nothing short of phenomenal. Um, when you came into this community, prior to you coming to this community, this governing body, Jado, sat around and discussed with several people that were pitching to us what the future of our industry was going to be. And I think that we kind of talked of bioagro, but we never imagined that it would take the tone that it's taken today. And the fact that today, um, not only do we have plug and play in this community, in Shawnee County, Topeka, and the fact that we are looking not only at the dream of having them here, but also planting ground of an innovation center, it's nothing short of formidable. Um, thank you for your work. I am ever grateful and um, it's, it's just remarkable. Um, it's a big ask, but it's a phenomenal, phenomenal situation that we're in. Um, what questions does the governing body have for Katrin? I, I would just like to thank her for all the work she's done on this. And I, I'm, I'm excited about this. I, I think this is a, a, a great opportunity for us to, to attract a lot of businesses to Topeka and, and, and who knows how many of them will just take off. And, and, uh, but it, it's, it's a step we need to do. It's, it is a bold step, but it's a good one. Commissioner Thank Cook. you, Catherine, for all, for all your work on this. Catherine, can you touch base with us that if this is approved today, what are some of the next steps or what things would you envision in the future from here? <coughs> Absolutely yes. Um, so in in the in the development process for this, um, in, in terms of next steps, uh, the the approval today will enable us to um, start uh, detailed contract negotiations about uh, the incentive agreement, of course, and um, and will kick off uh, the uh, finalizing uh, the, the schematic design, engage legal teams, and. Um, and other agreements and contracts that need to be in place. So um, we will we'll be able to uh, share with you um, a, a draft of the incentive agreement um, shortly. Any Thank other you. questions for Katrin? We do have Doug Wolf signed up to speak for this item. Mr. Wolf, are you available? Hi, Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can. Thank you. Um, and thanks to the board for letting me speak. I'll be very brief here. Uh, my name is Doug Wolf. I'm president of Security Benefit here in town, and I'm also chair-elect of Go Topeka. So I look forward to working more closely with this board and getting to know getting to know all of you over the next couple of years. And um, I just wanted to kind of reiterate how excited I am um, and, you know, a lot of our employees at Security Benefit are. Uh, we've had the privilege of being able to work with Plug and Play. We're part of their insure tech and fintech verticals and been, uh, worked with them for the last couple of years. Uh, it's an extremely impressive organization. Uh, when you go out there, you're highly motivated people, um, they've been involved in some, you know, fantastic startups and accelerations over the years. Uh, people from all over the world, when you go there, uh, and I know as Katrin mentioned, we have some companies from all over the world here in our first 10, which is exciting. Uh, but one of the things that you really get when you go there, it's not just the people. It is the facility. It is the fact that there's so many entrepreneurs and innovators, you know, in a campus like that. And there's always a lot going on and they're learning from each other. And it's why a lot of these startups end up going there for the 90 and 180 day period uh, and learning uh, and being able to bring, you know, corporations into one area where they can meet with several startups at once. Um, so I think this would really be the next step in Topeka's relationship with plug and play. And I think it would help cement this relationship for the long term. And it'd be the next step in getting what Topeka can really get out of, get out of this relationship. So I think it's really important. I also think it'll be great for downtown. And one of the ways that we really want to revitalize downtown, we've got a lot of things going on down there that are great, but having something like this there I think would just cement all the work that we've done so far 
And the last thing I want to say is that I have complete confidence in Katrin, as several people have said. I think she's done a fantastic job and complete confidence in the Innovation Advisory Board and the process they've gone through so far to get us where we're at. So with that, um, I'll turn it back over. Again, I appreciate the time and I look forward to working with you all over the next couple of years. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, what is the pleasure of this body? Oh, Councilman Emerson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, obviously, I don't get a don't get a uh, vote on this, but I just wanted to say that I fully support this. This is a fantastic opportunity for Topeka, and indeed, I see all this work as as the future of our community. So I really appreciate uh, Mr. Wolf and all the the work that he's done, and and Catherine and her crew there at. Uh, the partnership. Uh, just well done. Thank you. Let's make sure that I can look to see if there's any other hands. Feel free to yell at me. The council does it too. So, <laughs> okay. Councilwoman Hiller. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. I just appreciate all the work as well as uh, Katrin's comments about how, in a way, this is the epitome of the kind of project we've been working toward. We've been laying the groundwork with growing entrepreneurs and that ecosystem and what some of us call the big box businesses and so on, developing, getting experience in developing land and, and, and spaces. We've got Washburn Tech and so on, and, and she pointed out how the um, the Innovation Center itself, as well as the spinoffs, will provide more business to our local businesses, accountants and attorneys, and just buying supplies and travel and so on. And, and that puts a face on those big numbers that we get in terms of what the economic impact would be. And I appreciate that it's happening and also that you took the time to point that out uh, for us and for, for the community. Thank you again. All right. As a reminder, Councilwoman Ortiz is the person holding Councilman Padilla's vote. Is there a motion on the floor? I'll move for approval. Motion moved by Commissioner Ripon. Do we have a second? Second. A second. Uh, I'll take Council, uh, Commissioner Mays, former Councilman. <laughs> <laughs> um, at this point in time, if there's no additional comments or questions, we will proceed to vote. Mayor De La Isla? Yes. Deputy Mayor Padilla? Yes. Yes. Councilmember <laughs> Council Member Nager? Yes. Councilmember Lesser? Yes. Commissioner Ripon? Yes. Commissioner Cook? Yes. Commissioner Mays? Yes. We have seven yes. People, this is historic. Um, I, I, I think that we have to stop for a second, Katrin, um, your level of transparency, your level of communication, uh, your board, we cannot forget Mark Ruel, Doug Wolf, um, and the cadre of other individuals that have been volunteers sharing this forward. Um, I remember at one point in time saying that I thought Topeka could be the next Silicon Valley, um, and I was looked upon like I was crazy. Obviously, I didn't make it happen. Uh, Katrina and the team did, but look at where we're at today. Uh, mark this day in your calendar, and 10 years from now, let's take a look what's happening, because I think that it's going to be transformational. Um, this is the type of investment that our community is worthy of. And, um, and I appreciate the vision of the board. I appreciate Matt's vision by bringing Katrina in, um, and the work that you guys have all put forward. What a great day for our community. What a great day. We now move on to the non-action items, non-action item A. Item 4A is JETO, Local Business Recovery Task Force Update. All right, who's taking this one? Oh, Councilman Padilla, Deputy Mayor Padilla was going to take this one. Um, at this point in time, what I can do is to provide a brief report. Uh, Glenda, I know that you have been able to start granting out the money. Um, the, the body met uh, a second time. They refined the criteria of the grants. 
The grants were allocated in increments of $250,000. And the reason that those grants were allocated to a max of $250,000 for the first portion is because we knew that the ARP funds were going to be dropping into communities, and therefore we did not want to duplicate those efforts, especially considering all the big things that are happening in our community with economic development. Um, the, the exciting news as well is that these dollars have been able to significantly benefit several organizations in the community. Uh, last Glenda spoke about uh, with Molly, she indicated that $240,000 out of the $250,000 had been allocated. Glenda, would you be so kind to provide us an example of the businesses that have received the funds um, <coughs> and how this ties into uh, those organizations? Would they be able to now participate in the funds that are dropping from the federal government with the guidance that is coming down? So we have seen 72 applications. Uh, the first week that we put the grant out, uh, we got about 60 applications. Slow down just a little. But we are really uh, excited about being able to let uh, $241,000 go to our businesses in the community. Uh, we are at uh, 24 businesses will receive that first round, second round. We have $288,000 that will be going out. Um, that's 31 businesses there. Uh, 14 additional businesses are waiting on. Um, additional information. They're sending us some additional information. Two were ineligible, and then one withdrew because they didn't want to complete the process. But for the most part, it's been really, really exciting to see them all come in. Now you ask the type of businesses, it goes anywhere from um, event space to uh, trucking companies to this is every type of business that you can think of. Glenda, uh, one, of the in, one of the areas of impact that we chose as a committee was to ensure that we were supporting minority business. What percent of the businesses that have received this are minority businesses? You know, um, so we are, we are having a sort of a struggle with minority businesses. I have three, four, five. Have less than a dozen minority businesses, but we are uh, giving out the information, talking to, to them, uh, hopefully helping them walk through the process. But we know that we got to do a bit, a bit more. So what I've done was, um, I'm going to leave them at the library. I'm going to leave them wherever I think businesses go. The application, and then I'm going to uh, starting next week. We're going to be out and about. Uh, making sure that businesses have them in their hands. So that first round didn't allow us to do much more because it was so busy. Mm -hmm. uh, this round, we can do that. We have a little leverage as Wonderful. far as time is concerned. Wonderful. Do any of the additional members of this committee, uh, Commissioner Mays and Councilman Lesser, have anything that they would like to add to the discussion? Well, we put a lot of thought into this. Um, we met several times. Um, we had a lot of help from not only Glenda, but also Corey um, from City of Topeka uh, in putting the application together, the criteria. Um, it, was a, it was a good team effort. Um, I'm happy to see that people are applying and, um, and it sounds like most of them uh, have been eligible from what we've received so far, a good chunk so far. Um, and so, so that's encouraging. And, and like was mentioned earlier, um, we are going to get some uh, ARPA money coming in soon. And so hopefully we'll be able to continue this program on a much larger scale with some of that money. Mm -hmm. um, rather than taking the money out of JADO, we'd be able to take it out of those funds instead. And so um, uh, that's uh, something on the horizon uh, very, very soon, actually, because it sounds like that money is starting to come in now. So um, so that's something to look forward to. But this and the money that they're getting for the hotel, um, and I'm sorry, for, for the food services area, sort of competing, uh, they are going in whatever direction they can at the time. So 
as this came out, so did the money for restaurants and food trucks, et cetera. So a lot of them are going there. We do have a couple of defaults that they can take advantage of. Absolutely. And, and again, this is part of the wisdom of the committee of allocating, having the, the ability to go further than 250000 But for us to say we are going to start supporting our community to stop the bleed, but also be mindful of the support that we're receiving and having an established program is going to be extremely supportive for us as we do receive those federal funds. So thank you so much, Glenda, for your presentation. Um, at this point in time, uh, we stand for any questions from the body. Yeah, Mad Madam Mayor. Uh, yes, I Councilman have, Lesser. I did have one question. One of, the, one of the criteria that I had asked for through the process was to have a report um, that gave me uh, yes. who was awarded all those. Where are we at with that? You, were, you did ask that. Uh, we have a review committee. So we have two uh, pieces in the review committee. I can send you what I have tomorrow with the 17, I'm sorry, the 72 businesses. But I wanted to make sure that it was clean enough for you to see uh, who was getting what. But I have it right here in front of me um, and I can get it to you. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Councilwoman Hiller. Uh, just a question for the committee members or whoever can answer. The, the discussion when this idea was sort of hatched here at JADO was that there were certain restrictions on prior money such that businesses, that some businesses who needed help had not been eligible. And um, at this point, we still have money left over in some of those funds that already existed. This is obviously moving both for the JADO body but also for the public, could could you explain what it is that you provided in in the eligibility for this program that is different from others that's opening up opportunities? Uh, just so we're sure who was missed out and, and who can get this and, and we can help as well. So, well, the nice thing about this uh, fund of, of money was that there were really not many restrictions with regards to the type of business that was going to apply for it, including businesses that were startups were able also to apply. Um, we had one prime example, for example, um, Leslie's business, which is, you know, tender loving uh, pet care. Yeah. And... Um, she did not qualify for any of the federal funds. Right. But one of the things that this team did was ensure that the application was open and inclusive enough that, that businesses such as hers that were providing a service um, were able to partake in this. Um, so, so that opened up. Glenda, are there any other details that were missing? Yeah, and so businesses that have been in business for 90 days, um, as, 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 I think the limit was 90 days, so we allowed mm -hmm. them to even those that started this year, uh, Councilwoman, to come in and take advantage of uh, this fund as well. So we did very little excluding. We did more including in our process than anything. And so um, the larger percentage of the businesses out there have the ability to take advantage of this program. So in I just want to make sure we all know what it was that you added. So in particular, startups, as long as they were are moving along, right? Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, any other particular changes? No, we still ask for financials. We still ask for, um, you know, uh, an explanation of the hardship, uh, those kinds of things. So we still are digging uh, that deep. It's not as easy uh, as you think might think. That's why it's taken a little while for us to go through the review process. So um, we do have a review committee that looks at everything. And I mean, absolutely everything. And so they sent it back to us and said, we need more. And so we dug a little deeper, but uh, we made sure that it was an inclusive grant process. Well, Councilwoman, I could actually uh, go step by step and give you everything in the morning if you'd like that. I can send you what those uh, criteria were. I don't have it in front of me, but it's a list of about uh, 18 to 20 things that they must do. And Glenda, if you could do that for the whole JADO body, that way the whole body is able to have access to that. And that way our JADO members are able to spread them out onto their communities and demographics as well. Almost more importantly, um, 
if we know where anybody that we run into can find it on your website or elsewhere, ho hopefully it's a pretty simple address, then we can refer people straight in. Uh, it's supporttopeka.com. Okay. okay. You can find a paper copy in Visit Topeka's lobby downstairs. Okay. Um, and then um, I have a handful that I can deliver to anyone that needs it, if that's the case. Well, supporttopeka.com is really helpful. That's easy, and uh, if people are going to find that as soon as they open it up, that will be really helpful. Thank mm -hmm. you. We, we also went ahead and put links on um, both of, uh, at least when we discussed this, we were going yeah. to put links on the county's website, which I know we've done, and then also on the city's website. City's website um, as well. So, so that it could be accessed from all three of those sites um, uh, through a simple Google search, probably. So. Great, that's important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor. Yes. Um, I just wanted to, I just went to supporttopeka.com. There's also the resources in Spanish. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Madam okay. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. Councilwoman Ortiz, thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wanna to say to the committee, thank you, thank you, and thank you. Um, and I say that three times because I, did have some businesses that didn't qualify for the first go round. And um, I've been assured that they would probably um, get through this second round. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Molly for the, um, for the applications. And although to my fellow councilman, Mr. Mays, um, I think the links are great but you have a lot of people that they just can't get through with the links. So we always have to be mindful with our applications. Um, I too would like a list of the business owners who need help are, 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 are you know, to say that we have 12 small business owners, we're not touching them somewhere. Um, whether it's, they're thinking it's the same pot of money or, or whatever. Um, so I, I would like a list of that as well to see okay. how I can help. Um, Karen, I, I carry these applications with me so I can just give them out. And I've also given Liz one to mail out. So if we know of somebody, we can mail them out. But it's okay. very important that we, that we make sure that we go around and hit everybody again because everybody is struggling. Um, yeah. I will be going tomorrow on my businesses on Southeast 6th Street, which the city has um, tore up. And um, so there's no businesses, there's no cars going through there, you know, uh, no traffic like there usually is. And so I know that they're getting hit really, really hard. But I just wanna thank the committee for um, putting up with my emails, asking when it's gonna be ready, when it's gonna be ready, when are we doing this? Did you guys forget me? I know I know, I was bugging Lesser and he, but he don't care, but Mays, I know I probably, <laughs> struck a nerve there. So I apologize. I, I just think that this was very important to our businesses. And um, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and um, Councilwoman Ortiz, with the, um, with the restaurant grant opportunity and this grant opportunity, if you are going out to call on businesses, I will probably tag along with you because I, if we need to help them fill out the application, uh, we can do that. Well, I'm glad you said that, Glenn, because I have one on my phone recorder that this gentleman does need help. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll be sending them your way, but I'll be in touch with you. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Madam. You're Mayor. welcome. Thank you. All right. I'm sure that the committee will meet at some point again and um, discuss next steps. But this was a great report. Thank you so much for all of you who participated in helping make sure that we had um, enough meat to provide our community with regards to the success of this program. We now move on to the next item, item B, if the clerk would read. I mean, yes, item B. <laughs> mean to interrupt, but did she read it? I wasn't able to hear it. Yes, yeah, she did. She read it. Okay, thank you. Sorry. It's all right. 
<laughs> Zoom. Thank you again. Um, so the talent relocation incentive is just one part of our overarching talent relocation initiative, Choose Topeka. And it was designed, of course, to support not only our existing employers in recruiting, but also so to, to support long-term retention and growth of employees. With the addition of a remote work option to the incentive component, we continue to see steady interest in submissions for both incentive options and expect to see strategic incremental increases that align with projections of sustainably growing our workforce. Next slide, please. So to date, over 5,400 resume and interest submissions have been received. Employers have submitted 29 candidates to the program and 19 remote workers have also been accepted. And new just this week, the entire 300,000 of the first round of funding has been fully encumbered to be allocated. We had that last little bit that was left available for employer matching and that's no longer there. So that's 180,000 in employer matching incentives and 120,000 in remote worker incentives plus 25,000 of the second round of funds have been committed for remote workers and we continue to have interest from employers too. We have up to 95,000 left in additional funds that can be provided specifically for remote incentives. If you'll recall, we only allow up to 40% of the $300,000 to be allocated for remote incentives with any of those funds. I also wanna, next slide please. So initially, and I think you'll remember this and we'll transition and Freddie will get into the numbers a bit more for you as well, but initially we forecast or projected that we would hope to bring between 40 and 60 workers with those dollars in that first round of funding. We were also hoping to see an average salary of 60,000 for those employees and intended that there'd be a six times return on investment within that first year with a two and a half million economic impact for the one year. What we have found as we've basically um, provided the entire or encumbered the entire amount of funds with 48 candidates, we're seeing closer to an average salary between remote workers and employer matching of $87,000. And that comes out not only with, with those salaries, but perhaps um, trailing partners and other family members that may join them. I, and over 14, 0.6 times return on investment within one year and a 3.9 million economic impact in year one. And I'd like to turn it over to Freddie Majin, our economist, to be able to talk a little bit more in depth about the data and those numbers and the metrics for this part of the incentive. Freddie? Uh, thank you, Barbara. Uh, so, so I will start with these. The program Choose Topeka, it's uh, outperforming our initial expectations. Uh, when this program was in the concept phase, we were thinking, we we're modeling between 40 to 60 new workers, and that would be, that would include a mix of home buyers and home renters. Uh, those 40 new workers would make on average $60,000 annually, and that would produce uh, an economic impact of around $2.2 million in the first year. But uh, we did underestimated how successful the program was going to be. Uh, as Barbara mentioned, we have 48 new workers uh, that make on average $87,000 per year. Uh, so we know that some of these workers also brought working spouses. We don't know exactly how many, but at least we have counted around seven. Uh, half of those participating in the program purchased a house and the other half decided to rent. Uh, so using the actual data, we updated our model, and it shows that the current economic impact uh, of the program is significantly larger than expected. Uh, slide. Uh, so our initial model predicted $2.2 million uh, in total output in the first year, but after adjusting the estimated wages to the actual wages of the workers, the final output is closer to $4 million in the first year. Uh, our cumulative return on investment is more than double uh, than initially expected. Uh, and one thing to keep in mind is that these figures you're seeing on the screen, they do not include those working spouses. Uh, so we know seven, uh, we don't know uh, the totality, but uh, we know that uh, it could be more than uh, the seven working spouses that, that we know so far. So 
these new these new workers uh, not only increase the tax base, but they also support our local businesses, our groceries, restaurants, and retail stores, etc. Uh, we also know that living and working in the same city and county uh, can have a number of benefits for individuals and municipalities, uh, including shortening communities for the workers, uh, nurturing a greater uh, social and economic diversity, uh, and fostering a, great, a greater sense of cohesion within the community. Uh, so at this point, if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, otherwise, I will pass it back to, to Barbara. Any questions for Freddie? Barbara, take it away. Thank you very much. The only other thing, and, and of course it continues to be a moving target uh, as we continue to move forward, we have so much earned media that continues to, to impact this program and continues to generate interest and involvement from hearing from communities across the country as they're interested in what we've done and they love the model and the program to, um, I believe Bob has been talking with uh, the BBC this week and they may be in town here shortly to be able to look at things that way. We've had, of course, coverage in the Wall Street Journal on, on multiple occasions and showcasing different candidates that are in the program. On average, we probably see, and it can, it can jump from month to month, but we've earned well over $5 million in earned media. We usually see anywhere from fifty dollars to $80,000 in any given month. Could see an average of anywhere from, from 10 to 16 or so um, uh, articles within any given month as well. So it continues to generate well beyond what we have intended and impacted. And I also wanted to give you some some numbers related to demographics. While this is a moving target too, as we continue to receive applicants throughout the program, we're currently seeing approximately 20% of the candidates are reflective of people of color that we would see aligned very similarly to our demographics within our community too. That is fabulous, Linda. I mean, Barbara. Any questions for Barbara? Councilwoman Hiller. Just a short one, Barbara has to know this is coming. Um, when, when this program was created uh, at, at my request, um, the, the body incorporated the term rehab into the, the, the headline for home ownership rehab or rental. And for, for me, representing the district that I do and the city as a whole, the idea of attracting people not just into the high-end fringes, but into our older neighborhoods was, was what I'd hoped for. Can you react to whether that worked at all? I think it did. I think that's helpful. It's interesting you would say that. And, and I will tell you, I, of course, get alerts for a lot of these different pieces of media coverage. And what I did see, I remember, in just the last week, some of that national coverage that indicated things about re rehabilitation of homes. And it did flash through my mind, Council Councilwoman Hiller. I'm like, oh, Councilwoman Hiller will love that. <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, we are seeing that. We're seeing where um, there is kind of that impact. We're also hearing from, from workers that they want to be able to continue to even give back once they purchase and, and they do some, you know, remodel or rehab within their own home. They also intend to do that for additional homes and, and see the opportunity to be able to invest in the community where they've selected to live. Thank you so much. You have told me some of the stories and, and I'm, I'm just thrilled that it's, it's working in that way as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Linda, thank you, and Freddie, thank you. Uh, Brent, uh, my gosh, I keep, get, I'm stuck on Glenda, because <laughs> I know that Glenda's going to do the next one. Barbara, thank you. Freddie, thank you. And excited you. to see the success that this program is having and the impact that it's having in our community. We now move on to item C, if the clerk would read. Item C is Topeka Housing Authority Empowerment Center presentation. I should say Barbara, just so that I could just reverse it, but Glenda. <laughs> okay. So for the past year and a half, I've stood before you and talked a little bit about the uh, collaboration between the Housing Authority and EMBD, Go Topeka. Um, the process was partially interrupted as everything was last year by COVID, but I am excited to introduce to you um, Trey George, the president and CEO of the Topeka Housing Authority to give you an update and invite you to an opportunity. So, Trey. 
Thank you, Glenda, and good evening, everyone. Um, I, I'm really excited about this. Um, people probably get tired of hearing me say this, but this is truly a really big deal uh, for, for our community, for our residents, um, and we're really excited about it. Um, what we're talking about is the THA Empowerment Center. Um, Glenda Washington and, and the entire GTP staff have been phenomenal to work with on this program. Um, what we've what, what, what they have done is they've worked with our residents um, and given them an opportunity to um, become entrepreneurs and create their own businesses. Um, as, as most people know, starting your own businesses is, is no easy feat. Um, and the reason why I'm really excited about this program is I think it was set up perfectly. I think that it is given um, the, the tools necessary to hopefully make these businesses successful. Um, I'm equally as, as proud um, of our residents who have stuck with this program. Um, as, as Linda mentioned, this did get delayed due to the pandemic. Um, and even more so, you know, initially, um, I believe there were there was roughly 50 people that came to the um, initial meeting to hear what this was about. I think from that, roughly half um, expressed an interest in being able to create their own business. And um, what we've ended up with is is uh, four really dedicated people who have stuck with this program longer than even anticipated. Um, and Glenda did an excellent job of keeping them engaged during the pandemic, uh, when you know everybody was trying to figure out how to meet and how to move forward. Um, and I I think our residents did a really awesome job of um, sticking with it as well. Um, the, the facility has turned out beautifully. I'm, I'm really, really excited about this. Um, and we definitely would like to invite you all to the ribbon cutting, which is this Friday from two to four. Um, the facility is located in uh, the Pine Ridge neighborhood. It is uh, the newest addition to the Pine Ridge Partnership, which, um, you know, thanks to the delay of the pandemic, um, is celebrating its uh, 10th uh, year, um, which is pretty phenomenal. And we're really proud to have the THA Empowerment Center be added to that partnership and GTP to be added to that partnership as well. Um, Again, I just I cannot I cannot express how big of a deal this is. Um, if you can imagine um, our residents living and who are are low income to extremely low income individuals having the opportunity to be paired up with coaches and mentors to educate them on how to properly open their own business, how to operate their own business, and then be given the financial tools to make that a reality is truly life changing. I mean, it, it is, you can take somebody from, from living in poverty to having the ability to support their own family and be self-sufficient, which is the ultimate goal for any of the, the families that live with us. Um, we want people to be able to utilize the services and the benefits that we have to offer to them for the time that they need it. But obviously the shorter the time is, the more people we can we can reach. So um, thank you very sincerely from, from our board, from our staff, and from our residents for allowing this opportunity to happen. And, and please join us on Friday. I think you'll be um, quite impressed with how, how uh, the facility and the, the participants in this program have some really awesome businesses. And um, I, I'd invite you to come join us, please. Yes. Thank you, Trey. I appreciate it so much. We have a bakery, a daycare, kids play zone, and a home repair handyman that are they will be opening opening their businesses on Friday. So we really need your support as a community. We ask that you come out for the ribbon cutting and uh, just give them your support. Um, they are a little bit nervous, right, Trey? Um, call me five times a day, each one of them, but it's okay. You too, huh? Yes, you too. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we're excited for them, and it is life-changing. So um, we will see you all on Friday at 2 o'clock. Please. And if you uh, don't Trey, know there... where it is, it's where the old aquaponics. I apologize. Yes, but I should have included that. 2705 Southeast 10th Street. Um, so if you're uh, coming off of California, um, you'll uh, go down 11th, take a left, go to 10th, turn right, about halfway down the block, you'll, you'll, you can't miss it. Is there any way we could get an email with that information? <laughs> sure. to you tonight. <laughs> Absolutely. I would appreciate it. <laughs> Not a problem. Thank you, Glenda. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, for the Fair. presentation. Any questions? This is exciting. I mean, what a night for Topeka and Shawnee County. Um, you know, seeing not only the economic development boom that we'll have through our plug and play and, and new location for innovation and um, seeing how we are supporting our existing businesses and supporting the micro entrepreneurship dreams of families in low income neighborhoods. Topeka, Shawnee County, we're being model communities. So amazing, amazing night.
Um, the next item on the agenda is the quarterly report, and this is not really an item for the agenda. We had discussed that this is just as a, as a memo for everybody to remember that they have received their quarterly report, and that if they have any questions, to so feel free to contact Molly or any of the members of Go Topeka. The next item is the public comment, and we do have somebody that I don't know if he is going to be able to make it here tonight, but I will call on Mr. Bell to see if he is here. Okay, well, Mike, I know that you watch these meetings. Uh, your community loves you, and we're thinking of you. Um, and we look forward to catching up with you uh, when you're able to meet up with us again. That being said, the next thing on our agenda is a reminder of our next meetings. Our next meeting is Wednesday, September 8th, and the one following is December 8th. We invite all of the members of the governing body to participate, whether you are a voting member or a non-voting member, so that you can be part of this awesome action of the great things that are happening in our community like tonight. With that being said, if there is no other items that the body would like to discuss, this meeting is now adjourned.